afternoon and good evening, everyone. This is Unbridled Talk Live on Wednesday night, and we are on time at 8 p.m. here. I'm excited. So we have Carly, and we have Greg Honeyhead back for 2.0. Hello. How's everybody? Did you have a good Christmas? Island. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's kind of in that period between Christmas and the new year when it's just quiet and you're like, what am yeah. I doing? With, what is life really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know about that for me. I worked over the holidays and haven't really stopped. So honestly, yeah. I couldn't figure out what day it was for the last three days. I just, I like, usually my brain needs the weekend to like reset and like, okay, Monday feels like a Monday, but honestly, every day just feels like a Monday right now. And that's because you you worked over the weekend too, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I know. No, and I it understand. hasn't stopped. And I'm just like, wait a minute, what, what's going on? <laughs> oh, the lives tonight. <laughs> this is, it's Wednesday? What? <laughs> that's where I'm at right now. Oh that's my funny. gosh. Yeah. I have asked like five people through the day. I'm like, what day really is it today? Is it really Wednesday? Really? Like the time is just, yeah. Going by. I'm gonna share this with a couple of people here off of Okay. Greg, how was your holiday? What did you do for Christmas? Actually, it was pretty quiet. This is probably the quietest year that we've had in a while, and I'm okay with that. We have a new puppy coming tomorrow, um, so we've been doing stuff with that and um, getting things ready. Have uh, putting together like an outdoor X pen, so we yeah. could let her out, uh, you know, back in the middle of the night and that kind of stuff. So it's just been really quiet, and really Christmas has kind of been on the burner, you know, because we've had so much else going on. Right. Oh, so some it's years female, like that. female puppy. Yes, another Spinoni Italiano. Okay. And um, we're gonna we're gonna pick her up tomorrow. Awesome. Now the Spinoni right. Italiano. What is that breed meant to do? What do they do? Um. Well, they're they're gun dogs. So they they okay. they retrieve. They point. They're scent dogs. Uh, Zeke, the one we have now, um, mm -hmm. who is mine. He does search and rescue and stuff like that. Um, oh, that is crazy. So they're they're really cool. Um, of course, I got to share a picture, right? So um, yes. let me see if I can get this up here. Here, here's Zeke as a baby. Oh, he's so cute. And, and now he's um, what ten months old. So he looks a little bit different. Um, here, okay. This is this is this was my whole Christmas right here, taking that picture. Oh, that so cute! <laughs> Look right. at that face. Right. Yeah, they're, they're a lot of fun. And uh, it's such a cool breed, too. It is. It is. So pretty much, like I say, just quiet. And then New Year's is around the corner. But, you know, just I like this week because I don't really do a lot of work. I just kind of hang mm -hmm. out. What's disappointing is the weather's not good here. It's rainy. So exactly. usually we're outside fixing fence or doing something outdoorsy. Nah. Not now. Yeah, that's kind of it's the same. It's just been sort of dreary and gray. And you're like, ah, and my for the first time ever, my company shut down for a whole week. The factories are like shut down. So cool. we have an entire week off and it's like, ah, I have a, yeah. but you can't ride or can you? I can't ride. Even though it's exactly. wet. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know. It's, it's really muddy right now. So it's yeah. a bit difficult. Yeah. yeah. It's soppy out there. How about you, Carly? What'd you guys do? Um, we had dinner with my family who lives in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia on Christmas day. So I got off around 3 34 o'clock. Tommy went fishing that day. And then we oh. ended up meeting in the middle at my parents' house. He had the boat still connected to his truck. And then I drove the dually to my oh, parents. Cool. And then we just had dinner and just like watched the Grinch. Awesome. Yeah. It sometimes low key is better, right? You yeah. Know. Yeah. It was nice. Lucy's in uh, England. So we got to talk to her and her husband. They, they do a thing where, cause they're in Canada. So some years they do Christmas with most of the family in Canada. And then sometimes they travel to England and do it. Okay. So this year's England. So she's over there and she's getting to see a lot of stuff for the first time. And having nice. a ball. London is yeah. beautiful at Christmas time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. And, you know, no matter how much time you have there, you don't have enough to get. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. We've got Kenny in the chat here. Okay, awesome. Hey, hey, I want to put up my disclaimer and then I want to tell Kenny something. But first yeah. I want to put up my display disclaimer. Hold on one second. So here's the disclaimer, just if to remind you guys that the following discussion may include my opinions based on personal experience. 
which should not be considered direct advice. Please rely on manufacturer's information and or your chosen trusted source. Basically, I'm not saying I'm wrong all the time, but I'm also not saying I'm right all the time. And some things are up for debate. But what we were doing last week, and I hope to do again, is to get you thinking about things that you might want to research further. Or to share experiences and ideas like we do with writing and everything else. There's not always one way. But there are some things that possibly people are, have not considered that are important when it comes to trucks and trailers and stuff like that. Yeah. Kenny, Kenny, I wanted to answer something we talked about last week. You said uh, you had mentioned something about the heat of a wheel, like from a locked up brake, being hot enough to pop a tire. So I told you I didn't know really what it what the formula was. turns out that 10 degrees of pressure of temperature can be roughly one degree of temperature. So if you were to heat up a tire and a rim 150 degrees over what it was expecting, that could be 15 pounds. So yeah, that could do it. I don't know with a trailer brake if you can get enough heat because trailer brakes aren't that good. But I could see if you dragged a you know a truck brake for four miles down the road. Well, again, the tractor trailers. But I want to let you know, you were kind of on the right track. That, yeah, I think that could happen. may not be likely, but it might. That is crazy, though. I mean, just there's a lot to put into perspective, especially if you're new, I think, to trailering to and from competitions, like Carly's situation, where you're kind of just like dropped. Like you get into horseback riding, you don't realize what people don't know if they haven't grown up in the sport or had a boarding facility that was really adept at like kind of schooling you into all the things like I can't even imagine going out and buying your first horse and then being like oh well now I need a truck well now I need a trailer like now I need to know how to drive exposure. the truck a trailer exactly right. <laughs> like, right. yeah. it is so much and so I think it's so important that we almost gear this back like there are people even now in the sport of mounted games that are just getting into horses not just the sport so there's so much to talk about as far as selecting you know the right vehicles making sure that you have safety in mind what are you supposed to be running through your head before you even get on the road. Um, so we're excited to have you. Yeah, because it's to me, just even last week's conversation got me thinking in so many different ways that I haven't had to really be like, man, am I really truly prepared? Do I feel confident if something went wrong that I would know what to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so kind of picking up from where we were last week, if you if you all remember, we talked a bit about tires and we kind of came up with the idea that tires will age out and start to get brittle or dry rot or whatever, five years is when you really need to start thinking about possibly replacing them. Now, obviously, if you're hauling a lot, you're going to wear the tread out before that. But what that was really meant to have people think about is when those tires are seven, eight, and 10 years old, you're, you're pushing your luck, absolutely pushing your luck. And we talked about date codes, and people can go back and watch that. Um, and then we talked a little bit about trucks and payloads. So I'm going to throw kind of a question out there for people to think about it and maybe chime in on chat without Googling. Don't Google this, but what do you consider payload to be? If somebody says payload on a vehicle and just think about that for a second while we talk about something else and then we'll jump back at that. Okay. okay. So we, we talked a little bit about knowing the numbers and how you look at your, 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 the, the serial number plate on your truck, or you look in the manual and you get an idea of what your gross vehicle weight rating is, which is the truck, the most that truck can carry fully loaded with everything. And then we talked a little bit about towing weights, but we did, we kind of got off the subject of that. And, and there's something kind of important about that. And it will go back to payload with this too. But if you take, here, I'm going to pop this up and show you. This is, a, I, I'm a GM guy. So most of the stuff I'll talk about is from GM. And, and I know there's a lot to look at here, but basically this is from the GM towing book. And I think this is like a 20 might be for 2018. Um, okay. And you'll, you, what you'll see is things like, um, if I can do this, whether or not it's like, for example, a double cab with dual wheels. Okay. And then which engine it has in it. Okay. can affect the towing capacity. And then when you go over to, um, I'm going to go to the top so you, uh, you're not going to be able to see the top because I cropped it. Maybe if I hold my finger down, sorry. Um, the, the top will have what they estimate the curb weight to be. And we'll talk about that for a minute. And then they'll talk about the payload. 
typically like kind of back of the envelope stuff, the, um, the weight of the truck curb weight, if you want to call it that, or the empty weight is typically the gross vehicle weight of the truck, which is on your sticker minus the quote payload. Mm -hmm. Then the, my, my trivia question to anybody who wants to try to answer it is what does that payload include? What does that mean? Okay. Um, Linda has a guess. Okay. Linda says uh, it's what a truck can carry. And yes, what would make that number drop? What what would make if 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 you say well well my truck can carry four thousand pounds of firewood in the bed because that's what the book says. No, not not the truck weight. You're on track with what it can carry. But what it can carry then becomes a question of what does that include? What does that mean? Payload is definitely what you can carry. But what a lot of people will be surprised to find out, and it depends on the manufacturer. I don't know if I, if I have the uh, screenshot, is what they, how they rate their payload. Some manufacturers will rate payload is, is what the truck can carry over what it weighs when it's sitting on the side of the road empty, which would be like curb weight. Okay. Without a driver. So when you put a driver in it, depending on your driver, you're deducting okay. weight from that. If you fill it full of fuel, depending on the manufacturer, fuel six and a half pounds per gallon, 36 gallon tank, a couple hundred pounds. Oh, wow. The two hundred pounds, oh, wow. the two hundred pounds, the, the two hundred pounds of junk you carry in your glove box. Right? Yeah, the tools that you carry under the seat. Yeah. The way manufacturers do it, basically, and there's really no one standard. Uh, uh, I looked at a, at a at a Ram, and it didn't include the driver. I looked at a GM, and it included uh, the allowance for a hundred and fifty pound driver. Oh. All right, right, and um, other ones will say it's it's dry weight which is no fuel, no person, no anything. Others will say curb weight, which you might be able to account for the fuel, but you're still not accounting for the driver because there's not a driver when it's parked on the curb. And because they're in a battle to get those numbers as high as they can for marketing purposes, a lot of times you have to look at all the little asterisks and stuff below it to make sure you understand what they mean. And, and I understand why they do it also because the only weight that they know is the weight of that truck when it leaves the factory. They can't tell you how much more you can put in it if they're, if they're not aware of how much extra stuff is on it. Okay. So when I say when it leaves the factory, it's not even, even when it leaves the dealership. Mm. And they're not going to re-sticker it to tell you, well, now you can carry less than, four, I'm using 4,000. That's pretty high, but my truck will do it. Let's say 2,500. If you order your truck, and you go, boy, those are really good. You know, look at that. I can carry all this stuff. And then they put running boards on it at the dealership. And then they put a gooseneck hick, hitch in the back. Mm -hmm. And then, you know what I mean? And they start adding stuff to it. You start adding stuff to it. That number drops. And, and I was kind of using the analogy. It's kind of like your paycheck. You know, you got that, that number at the top and you're like, hey, that's pretty good. Yeah. Then you got that number at the bottom, which is actually <laughs> what goes in the bank. Right. Deduct, 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 deduct. And, and and that's really important to know because what happens is people say, well, will a 2,500 carry a 12,000 pound bumper pull? Maybe, but you have to know the truck, how it's equipped, you know, mm -hmm. is anything added to it, which deducts and deducts and deducts and a lot of it deducts and passengers deduct. So again, let, let's just use 3,000 pounds as a number. Take out, if you have a gooseneck hitch, that's hundred could be 150 pounds on, on the in the bed. I didn't if you that. added anything we talked about. Wow. Right? Yeah. So, and, and, and guys, let me give you a pro tip. If you're trying to figure out the weight of your passengers, especially family, when you <laughs> get to the, to the significant other, my recommendation would be just kind of, eh, okay. And maybe not even write it down. Maybe just keep <laughs> it up here. <clears throat> I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really recommend doing that. Hey honey, I'm trying to figure out how much weight my truck will carry. How much do you weigh? You know, that probably would <laughs> go over as well. W what some people do is just ballpark 
is like 750 pounds for the, the, the driver passengers and a little bit of gear they might carry. And you can break that down, you know, a 200 pound male and 130 pound wife or, you know, 130 or 40 pound kid. I mean, when you get done with it, if you're just trying to be quick about it, 750 is not a bad deduction. So now we've taken 750 off of that number just to get in the truck. And then, and then again, you don't want to be on the edge. So you want to be conservative with those numbers. Right. But what happens a lot of times is people just say it can carry that. And it doesn't understand that that's the way it left the factory. And a lot changes after that. So Yes, that's a way to get your empty weight. What I really recommend people do, and we talked about this the other day too, is to go to the scales, go to the the loves or the pilot or whatever's around and run through the scales. And the way the scales work, they have multiple scales. So they can weigh the front of your truck, the back of your truck, axle separate, or you can, you can do it as a combination. They can weigh your trailer separate. Now, if you look at that diagram, the only thing that's not going to give you is the weight of the trailer. Mm-hmm. And the reason why is because the tongue of the trailer is on the truck and it's on a different scale. If you see that. Right. It will give you a rough idea. And if you go, well, okay, if it's loaded properly, it's the trailer plus roughly 15% tongue weight at 15% to what scale three says, right. Mm -hmm. Deduct a little bit of that off of scale two, but the easier way to do it really is to, um, Wait, no, hang on. You got this. It's okay. Don't panic. I got you. Pull you back. (laughs) Sorry. It's a complicated process to solo a layout so that they can see it and read. (laughs) But so I'm not sure. We didn't lose much, but basically, one way to do the scale thing is if you're out in your truck, take it over, take it over the scales empty. And then use the math that I talked about, but at least to give you an idea of how that truck sits with you in it. Right. Right. And then from there, you, you, you can, you can add your generator or your, those crazy heavy Yeti coolers full of your favorite beverage and ice that you throw in the back. Those things are heavy. Yeah. And and, and, um, bales of hay. And again, a lot of times I like to talk about bumper pulls because that's really where people have trouble because they've got the bumper pull. Then they have that empty bed and they just throw all this crap in the bed, you know, bending poles and, and you know, whatever. And it just adds it. Yeah. yeah. So get that weight of the truck. I, I do it because sometimes I'll take scrap metal down to the scrap recycler and they weigh you when you come in with the, all the metal in your truck and they weigh you on the way out. So I know what my trucks weigh just because, and it's free, you know. Yeah. Plus you make a little money on the scrap. So, you know, grab an old washing machine, take it down to the scrap yard and get weighed for free on the way out. And it, again, it's a ballpark, but it gives you an idea. Yeah. Yeah. Nice right. Comment. Yeah. I hadn't even thought about that. We need to stop taking loaded coolers, put all the ice and water in after. Well, it's true. And um, then if you really, really want to know the empty weight of your trailer, it's kind of a more complicated process because what you would have to do is go to the truck stop and do it one of two ways, either unhook your trailer, run your truck over it, hook up your trailer, run the combination over it. But you want to weigh it loaded with horses. And I would never unhook a bumper pull with horses in it, a gooseneck, some people, whatever, but it's not my thing. So to me that the empty weight of the trailer is not that important. You look, you see on these uh, classified ad sites, people will be like, Oh, what's the empty weight? What's the empty weight? I want to see if my truck can pull it. Unless you're going to go without your pony and tack and everything else to an event, it really doesn't matter. And, mm-hmm. and I'm going to show you actually a way you can figure out your empty weight and be pretty close without having to weigh the trailer. But weighing the combination is important. Weighing the truck definitely. And the truck and trailer hooked together for that combination weight. The actual empty weight of the trailer is irrelevant in my mind because it's never going to be empty. Shouldn't really be empty when you use it. And it, what people try to do is justify how their 1500 is going to pull a 9,000 pound bumper pull. Oh, it only weighs X number empty. Yeah, but that that's not really how we're going to use it. So here's <laughs> these. Your, I got to get some different things for these. They keep popping out. But anyway, um, let me see if I can, I can do this for you with a calculator. And again, your mileage might, might vary as we say, but this kind of works. 
if you take, um, like I, I know, I know that my bison weighs about 7,500 empty. And I know that it has a 12,300 gross vehicle weight rating on the sticker. Now, how do I know it weighs 7,500 empty? You can do this. 12,3. It's a three horse slant load, right? 12,3 minus three stalls. And this may not be how the manufacturer does it, but this kind of works for me. Pony one, pony two, pony three. And then let's go like 1,200 pounds of, oops, crap, one more time, sorry. 12.3 minus pony one minus pony two minus pony three minus, let's call it 1,200 pounds of stuff. And that's 7,200 pounds. So okay. that's pretty close. And, and really, you, you know, I could have, I probably for, for, to be more accurate, would have done Pony one, and again, this isn't what your pony weighs. It's the allowance that the manufacturer might have put in for each seventy four. See what I'm getting at? Right. My 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 little um, I'll show you another one. My uh, little two horse Sundowner has a six thousand pound gross vehicle weight, and I did run it over the scales, and I know it weighs about twenty six hundred pounds. So we're going to do it again. Six thousand minus pony one minus pony two and that's just a little thing with the dressing room so it's only going to have i mean even 800 would be a lot to cram in that dressing room yeah. and you're back to 2600 okay. and you know you know you might say well i've got living quarters or well mine's aluminum frame so it's different it's not because the gross vehicle weight rating will be different like yeah. I told y'all that my, my bison is 12.3. My, my new aluminum with a slide out is 14 because it's aluminum frame. That same aluminum with a, with a slide out would be 16 or 15 mm -hmm. if it was steel. It would be the plate. It's always the plate minus, much like your truck. It's that payload minus. Okay. Okay. So what this is designed to have you think about is you can't carry all that firewood in the bed of your truck when you have the family with you and all this other stuff you can, but that's why things break. And it, every vehicle on the door has an axle rating. And that's really important not to over uh, um, go over the axle rating. And again, that's what the scales will show you. If you can take it loaded, mm -hmm. the rear axle is usually is overloaded in a lot of situations with vehicles, the front axle, not as much, but, um, they don't leave a lot of wiggle room. For example, my um, 2002 Duramax crew cab that we had, I could not put a snow plow on it because that engine was already so heavy and it was a four wheel drive and everything. There's so much going on up front that the mm -hmm. plow manufacturers wouldn't make something that would be another, you know, 1500 pounds or whatever between the blade and the thing and the, that. So that truck, that axle just couldn't carry that much more weight. Now the back carry a lot. Mm -hmm. But again, load it full of firewood, hook a trailer to it. And and you see these people going down the road with this stuff. And it's like, you know, and the truck's like this. And it's like, this can't be good, right? So anyway, anyway, that's sort of to give you a better idea with the truck. So your payload is whatever they say minus everything you do. And that even includes the hitch. And even the hitch in the bumper, like that right. extra 20-pound thing. Right. The way to think about it, and I, I guess I'm repeating myself, is if it wasn't there when the factory let it out the door, mm -hmm. it needs to be deducted from that, that ability to carry because it's already carrying it. It's kind of built into the, what you do every day. What are so, the side effects oh, I, if you're not following that rule? Like what, what are symptoms that people could maybe be like, all right, maybe part of my problem is the, the payload. Maybe I am overexerting my truck. Okay. So without a trailer, let's just talk about overloading the bed. We talked the other day about how it can spring the front suspension up a little bit and cause it to be unloaded in the front and steer funny. It can damage wheel bearings. It's hard on the transmission. It's hard on the universal joints. It's, it's hard on everything that drives that truck. It can overload the tires. If you recall last week, we talked about how some of these tires don't have a whole lot of extra capacity over maximum. Mm -hmm. So you throw another thousand pounds. Firewood's the worst because you just can't 
estimate how heavy that stuff is, but you can see it when you're going down the road, <laughs> when somebody's going down the road. Um, so you're overloading everything about that truck. It causes it to be unstable. Um, if you have an older truck, it might be getting to rust. You can, the, the, the mounts where the bed mounts to the frame usually aren't mm -hmm. all that great to begin with. And when you start overloading, you can break them. I don't know if you've ever seen a pickup truck where like, like the bed is sprung back, <laughs> like it's folding. A lot yeah. of times that's not the frame folding. It's the, where, how the bed mounts to the frame, but you can also damage the frame. And, and a lot of people are driving older trucks. And sadly, there are some brands that really rust out that. So, mm -hmm. you know, you don't really want to be over. Those yeah. are the biggest ones. And again, if you get in an accident and if anybody inquires and, and, and there's lawsuits and whatever else, if they can figure it out and you're overweight, I mean, so be conservative with that Sounds stuff, right? You know? Right. Kenny does um, have a question. Sure, yeah. So he says, Greg, since you did racing, what are some ways to do weight reduction for a truck and trailer? Okay. Um, if you know what you're trying to achieve and, and, and we would do this. I'll give you one. If you had that, that big bed in the truck and you have a race car trailer and your race car trailer is not that full, but it sure is more convenient to throw that generator in the truck. Maybe that generator needs to go over the axles of the race car trailer. Cause mm -hmm. if the trailer has some extra capacity that you're not using and your truck is already struggling, you can move weight to the trailer, providing mm -hmm. there's, you've got that, you know, that cushion. And a lot of times you do, um, it's different with horses. I'm talking cargo horses. I mean, you're not going to put stuff in the stalls, you know, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, but well, once with, major, about with, with like our gooseneck, there's times where we've thrown hay in the back of the truck. Cause it's easy when we easily could have put it in a stall. That's not being used in the back of the trailer. Yeah. 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 So we use our front stall because we're usually hauling two ponies. And and the nice thing about gooseneck living quarters, and again, this is an opinion, don't hold me to it. It's kind of hard to overload the back of the trailer. Remember we talked about what happens when you get weight behind the axles and they start doing that. Mm -hmm. You can do that more in a bumper pull, but less probably in a horse trailer because you're leaving that room for your horse. But living quarters, goosenecks especially, are kind of heavy. And if you ever mm -hmm. look at some of the gooseneck trailers, the, the axles are set pretty far back. So it would take a lot to lever that thing back where you're too loaded to the rear, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So our, our second and third stall is more over the axles than our first stall, for example. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we'll do that. I, I, I'll try to rearrange that a little bit and not overload, overload. Now with a gooseneck, you don't have a lot of room in the, in the bed anyway. So mm -hmm. it kind of works in your favor to move it back, but going to a bumper pull, for example, you can take something that's, that's, you might, think is questionable to put in your truck. And if you set it in the right place in your bumper pool, providing you have the capacity, it kind of works. It, it can work out that way. Okay. Um, I, I bought a tractor with all this, all this equipment, like, you know, brush hogs and all this. And I was in that position because I was just kept putting everything on my trailer. And I'm like, I got to put some of this on my truck. I yeah. just can't do that to the trailer. It was kind of the opposite scenario. So that's one way to do it. But again, the best thing to do is to, to know your numbers, go to the scale. So you have an idea if it's even an issue, uh, but it is definitely uh, long-term something to think about, especially Consider, yeah. people, people load the same way every time. So you get into a bad habit, right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe there's a way to go. All right. It's a little more inconveniencing, but I believe this is going to be better on my equipment if I do it. Like start doing it this way well being more methodical i think about it there's a lot of times where like oh there's space and you just kind of stuff it there oh it's easy to access and you stuff it there versus like i'm thinking when i only take two horses and i'm taking all the coolers somewhere i should be just moving the coolers into the third slat or the fourth slat of our trailer in the back of the trailer over the axle versus necessarily we have like four coolers in the back of our truck and they're all super heavy you know right yeah so think about it like think about the math again if you have the capacity in mm -hmm. your trailer you're only taking two ponies and your trailer is designed to take three. I mean, you're already kind of remember the 1300, you're kind of already in a better spot because you don't have. Yeah. So that 500 pound Yeti cooler right over the axles of your truck is 500 pounds of payload, right? It's in a good spot yeah. over the axles, but it's 500 pounds coming off that. When it moves to the trailer, depending on how you get it to the axles, it loads the trailer 500 pounds, but with the tongue weight at 15%. Now, some of that only, like, again, real back of the envelope stuff, 15% ish of that cooler is now affecting the 
the truck. The payload of your truck, right. Yeah. Right. So okay. you're using the axles of the trailer to help carry that makes some sense. of that. And, it, and again, people could argue that, but, you know, it makes sense to consider shifting it around. Linda said, how would you load three ponies with slant loads? I'm not sure what you mean. Can you clarify? Do you mean you. the weight? Um, the weight, like what order would you put heavy to light? Is that what you're Let's thinking? run with that because that's how I would think. Okay. Yeah. Oh, what, we, what we do, and again, every, everybody's different, but we, we tend to tend to put the, the heaviest pony, if we can, in the front stall or definitely the second stall. Not, not yeah, not the rear stall. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. We're fortunate because our Tucker and Raleigh weigh close enough to each other that it kind of doesn't matter. But mm -hmm. of course, Danny weighs a lot less. So yeah. I wouldn't want to have Danny up front and have more of that weight towards the rear, uh, especially in a, it. If you have a if you have a slant load bumper pull again, bumper pulls are the ones that really get weird bad when they're overloaded and not loaded right. Goosenecks, I don't want to say they're a little more forgiving, but I think in, in a way they kind of are. <laughs> um, but I, heaviest pony, you know, first stall, second stall, never in the in the Back. rearward stall. Okay. And yeah, and and a lot of trailers like ours have the stud wall on the first one, so you can carry a lot of crap up there if you don't have a pony, and it won't slide back under the pony's feet. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's great. Yeah. It's a fantastic place, and it's better on the living quarters than putting stuff in the door and having it scratch the floor. Yeah, and, get all caught yeah. up in there. Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking that we're gonna have to change because we we would normally put DJ up front just because he's easy in the very front stall, but he's definitely the lightest pony. Um, and because the way that ours is, there's a door that opens with your first slant. We've got a four horse slant load. And so you don't really want the horse just pawing straight into a door versus like one of the walls. If you have a horse, that's maybe a little bit more unruly, but then we tend to have your load, I think in the back, it's worth yeah. considering. Definitely. Yeah. And, and sometimes people will do that because some ponies, depending on your slant load, can't turn around in one of the stalls. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you know, they don't like to back out or they can't turn around. So I'm going to put them in the rear. So they, you know, depending yeah. on if you have a, if you have a rear tack, sometimes they can't turn around in the rear, right? Yeah. <laughs> it really kind of depends on your trailer, but they'll load based on how easy it is to get them off. Yeah. Right. Versus what's better for your weight. And again, you know, you're talking about a few hundred pounds, but depending on everything else you've done with that trailer, that exactly. few hundred could matter. And if you get it back towards the axles without going behind, then the trailer is carrying the load more than the, yeah. Well, okay. So you've got a four horse trailer, four horse slant load, gooseneck, and you have 10 bales of shavings to take. And you have yeah. a rear tack area. That's like a, a tack compartment. So you could stow it there behind the axle. You have the front gooseneck portion. That's not finished. You could stow it there, but it'd be really over the tongue or you can throw it in the back of the truck. Where would they put it ideally? Well, I'm one of these that doesn't like to put a lot in the back of the truck with the gooseneck pivoting and all that. We've taken some hay bags and stood them up against mm -hmm. the rear window. Yeah. And then when you drive down the road, they went, you know, like that. But <laughs> um, at that, at that point, I would at least be thinking 50, 50, like don't, don't make it harder, okay. harder on the trailer by putting everything behind and potentially create an issue. Mm -hmm. But if you go dressing room, and behind you, you're basically canceling it out. You, you are adding more tongue weight, more weight to the trailer. So you got to make sure you're not overloading. And mm -hmm. we're going to talk about that for a second too, because that same math that you use on the, 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 the payload and the deduction is also the math you use to deduct your towing capacity. And it's also the math that you use in reverse to add, to demonstrate the weight that your trailer really is not what your empty weight is. Again, that's a number to me that means, Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> uh, hey, Carly, I wanted to show you this. We were talking about wrenches, and I bought one of these the other day, and it's really not that bad. Okay. Um, if you look at the bottom of that picture, it extends. <gasps> like this little, like, like, like telescopic thing, right? And it has two sockets, and between the sockets, it has four sizes. Nice. And I'm like, it was dirt cheap. I'm like, well, I like it because it, you can, you know, at least it's a little bit smaller. And it seemed yeah. to have enough, have maybe enough leverage to, uh, to do something might be something to think about that's cool where did you get it from um I, they sell them everywhere this was it we have a place in town it's like surplus city and it's okay. kind of like a they sell everything from fabric to like close out stuff yeah. and that like but, an but i've seen probably. that right yeah but i've yeah. seen like amazon and i think i grabbed that picture off amazon 
Yeah. You know. Now with it being retractable, I'm wondering now my tiny little body, I would have to stand on the very end to get any kind of torque at all. Do you think That's it okay. would hold, it would still hold up even though it was retractable? Yeah, it looks pretty good. It looks, okay. looks pretty decent. By the okay. way, you brought up something good. I'm going to, I'm going to pivot on that. Okay. I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm very impressed that, that the way you said I wouldn't have any torque on it. Oh, and th and this has to do with <laughs> trucks and towing. And if you want to get into the whole gas and diesel thing and why one might be more suited for towing, but I, I came up with this idea about the difference between horsepower and torque. I'm going to throw that out to Kenny before I say anything, Kenny, if you're, if you're, if you're uh, able to respond, tell me, tell me how you would describe horsepower and torque. Cause I have two examples. Oh man. Yeah. I'm curious. You might, it usually takes a minute for it to come through. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. Cause there, he's, he's probably yeah. just hearing it now. Um, but I can tell you while we're waiting, um, Diesel engines have a tremendous amount more torque for their size than gas engines. And that's one of the reasons why they're better for towing. It's why you see them a lot of times in uh, marine use and stuff like that. And, and, I'll, and then we'll give Kenny a second if he pops in. If not, I'll just, I'll just move on with it. Um, but you'll also see it in the towing specs, like, like the GM book. If it's the Duramax diesel, the numbers go crazy high, not only because they build heavier uh, components around it, like the drivetrain, but because of what that engine can, can pull. Mm -hmm. Um, what time? I, I'm afraid we're going to get oh, lost again in time. Oh, we're Just still good. Commented. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So. So let's read the question racing, really quick. Torque that's, is how that's quick. Pretty, Oh. You can get up to speed and horsepower is how well you can hold speed is what Kenny said. Okay. That's, I, I like that. In, in racing, we used to say horsepower was how fast you hit the wall and torque was how far, how far you moved the wall when you hit it. Okay. Okay. The difference, right? And that's what Kenny's my saying. My has a lot of torque. <laughs> so. Yeah. Here, here, here's my, here's my games analogy. I'm so proud of myself. And again, somebody might argue this, but I thought this would work. This, this would okay. work. Okay. So you're doing a running vault. Okay. Horsepower is you running beside the pony. Torque is you pulling yourself up into the saddle. Okay. Okay. That, does that make sense? Yeah. You can run with horsepower, but you can't necessarily pull yourself up. Get up and go. But you can with gotcha. torque. That's the leverage. Like Carly standing on the wrench or pulling, by the way, uh, pro tip, push on wrenches to never pull them towards your face. Um, <laughs> but standing or pushing, that, that tugging is that tugging is torque. Yeah, that tugging is torque. So anyway, I just want people to think about that because when you see anytime, okay, there you go, um, Kimberly. Because if you... If you see people talk about, oh, I got, you know, 900 horsepower. Like, yeah, but but it's that torque. It's that pulling. It's try, analogy trying to get a stump out of the ground with a chain hooked to the back of your truck. Mm -hmm. That's torque. You want that okay. pulling. That's, that's what's going to get us up and down hills, right? Correct. And that's why farm tractors, you know, have these big old diesel engines because they, they literally can pull a stump, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So. If you're, if you're out shopping for a truck and you're like, well, it's a gas truck, but it has, you know, and the guy's telling you, yeah, yeah, but it's got, you know, 500 horsepower in the towing world that that's nice. But like Kenny said, getting up to speed is one thing, but then holding it, you know, especially on Hills mm -hmm. is why you would want that. And so diesel is um, traditionally going to have more torque than a gas engine. Yes. And, and some of that also goes into how the truck is geared you know, the transmission, the, 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 the rear end of the truck, the differential where the drive shaft then mm -hmm. goes out, those have different ratios and it makes all the difference in the world. Um, okay. a towing rear has a different ratio than a highway rear. And that's like really old school talk, but that's, that's the way it used to be. So you could have two trucks parked side by side and they look identical, but you have to look at the build plate or know for sure, which, um, which, differential or rear end is in that truck because that same engine can really apply two different amounts of torque to the ground based okay. on um, that. So that's why there's not one answer for can a 1500 pull a 9,000 pound trailer? Can a 2,500 pull a, 
a living quarters gooseneck. It really depends on the truck, the numbers, and, and it's all available with the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mentioned build plate. I was trying to find, I don't know, I bet I can't find my picture of it. But like in a GM, you open the glove box and there's like a sticker with all these three, di three digit codes, numbers, letters, and all that. And you have to Google them to figure out what they mean. But that's every, every, that's the build sheet for that truck, right? So it, mm -hmm. it will tell you every option, every, every, every one of those represents an option. And sometimes you can get really lucky and you're like, my truck has the tow package. I didn't know that until I saw that on the, the code or my truck has the towing rear or okay. not, or the California emissions package, all that stuff's on there. Um, and that has more to do sometimes with used trucks. I think people know what they buy new, but I think also in our world, a lot of people are out buying used trucks and you know, those are things are things you want to know. Mm -hmm. Um, so moving a little bit now towards the back of the truck, again, you put a hitch on it. Like if there's a hitch from the factory, that's included in the weight. But if you add a hitch to it, um, that adds, that is deducted from your weight. Okay. Here's a build. Sorry. I'm, I'm, there's a build plate to give you an idea. And, and in my, that's mine. It's in the glove box. So you can go through all those numbers. Uh, this thing at the, like at the bottom here, this is actually the paint code, base coat, clear coat. Uh, they'll have the interior codes. Um, this is the wheelbase because okay. the towing specs will say, well, if you have the short wheelbase and the long, so, you know, if, if you really are bored, you can always just Google the codes on your truck. Um, you know, to get an idea of what, what your vehicle actually is equipped to do. Um, so, all right. So what we were talking about now, again, I'm going to go to bumper pool cause it's just, that's where I, I worry about people more. Um, and let's talk for a second, if I can find my picture of, um, the components that make up a hitch. Okay. Okay. Boom. So I'm gonna I speak, have no idea. <laughs> right? So, uh, no offense, but I'm going to speak Carly for a minute. Okay. You ready? Yeah, thanks. All right. So the doohickey okay. that goes on the under Proceed. the truck and it is bolted <laughs> to the truck, right? Yeah. Where the thingamajig <laughs> goes in with the pin. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the doohickey, the part that goes under the truck, is called the hitch receiver. It's not called the hitch. People call okay. it the hitch, okay. but it receives right. A hitch. The part that goes in it is, and I'll, I'll kick it over here again for a second, is called the draw bar or the ball mount, but people pretty much call it the hitch, right? So you got the two inch or two and a half or three inch thing in your truck, and then you have your hitch or your draw bar ball mount. Mm -hmm. uh, the important thing about that is if somebody says, well, do you have a two inch hitch on your truck? What are they talking about? Are they talking about the hitch receiver? Is like my one ton has a two and a half inch and I know some Fords have three inch. Okay. Like you can't just slide that thing in. You have to use reducers because they're designed for those really heavy trailers. Yeah. Um, the other thing about that, which a lot of people may or may not know, again, I'm, I'm telling people stuff they already know in a way, but I bet I can, bet I can show you a few things you didn't know. Um, those receivers are all rated. Okay. So just because it's got a two inch thing on it doesn't mean you can haul a 14,000 pound bumper pull trailer with it. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. So this, this is an example here. I don't, I think this is off of a Ford or something. And it says the, the weight, the towing weight, again, we're deducting for a whole bunch of stuff off that number. But this is what the hitch can carry. It has nothing to do with what your truck can carry. It has to do with what this piece of metal is capable of doing. Okay. Um, Maximum tongue weight, hitch weight. And then um, I will talk a minute about weight distributing, but you'll see those numbers are higher down here for the um, weight distributing. Yeah. Those are those bars you see that people put on their truck. And, and we'll talk for a minute about that. But every piece of a, Every piece of towing equipment that's hooked to your truck has a rating, okay? Every, th every single piece, even the chain, I mean, if you want to get real take it to, to, um, um, picky, even the chains do, okay? Oh, 
Okay. Now, that, now that's a hitch that would be on your typical, could potentially be on your typical, you know, 1500 or whatever. That mm -hmm. thing can't carry, that can't carry anything. Yeah. Right. But mm -hmm. you don't know, you, there's, most of them have stickers. You don't know unless you look. Here's another one real quick. This is a Kurt and um, that's showing 5,000 pounds, 500 pound tongue weight or with weight distributing 6,000 pounds. Now what's important about that one, the reason why I picked that to show you is because the other one went from like, I don't know, 4,000 to like 7,500. If you put a weight distributing on that particular hitch, won't do that. Okay. And okay. then the thing that a lot of people never see unless they look, they just make an assumption is this one. You've got to look at your hitch or your receiver. Now see, I'm doing it because this one says, do not use with spring bars. Oh, interesting. It's a 4,000, four, what is that? 4,500 pound with a 675 pound tongue weight, which is not that much. Mm -hmm. this, this is one that you might find like on a, on a SUV or something like that. Yeah. You know, you're not going to find that on a, shouldn't find it on a real pickup truck, a 1500, or I call them 1500. You know, you, we're talking F-150. It depends right. on where you're from, but that half ton truck, you shouldn't see that, but you should look, you should wipe the grease off and see. Then for example, the, the, well, I'm not going to go out of order here. Give me a second to, uh, to show you this. Um, so then I think this was the doohickey, right? It right. has, it has a rating. Oh my gosh. The doohickey has a rating too. <laughs> yep. So what's bolted to your truck has a rating and what every, whatever you hook to, it has a rating 6,000 pounds. And, and one way you can tell with them, I mean, you should look at the numbers, but they have um, the hole that's drilled in it for the ball can be one inch or one and a quarter or whatever. Like, like a bigger hole would take a ball with a heavier shank. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But this is what I see. Sometimes I'll see that 6,000 pound hitch on a three horse slant load bumper pull full of junk. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, that's a 9,000 pound trailer. Yeah. It's got to be a 9,000 pound trail, old steel trailer full of stuff. I mean, so it, it's worth it. And, and these things aren't expensive. So if you go out and even if you can't find the rating, um, it's worth replacing it with something, you know, is good. Um, mm -hmm. so the ball, they have ratings that what that means is, uh, it's a two inch ball. Usually they'll mark if it's two or uh, two and five sixteenths, or yeah. I think one and seven eighths is the little guy for like, you know, minivans. So that says two inch and it's um, 6,000 pounds. So, so if, every... if you were to put together like a worksheet, cause like that for me would help like almost, okay, what do I have to go out and inspect on my truck, my trailer? It sounds like we need to investigate our truck carrying capacity, trailer carrying capacity and weight. Then we've got to look at, your doohickey and your thingamabob. Uh -huh. Thingamajig. 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 Get it right. right. And the ball. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, you should know all the way down. And 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 technically, the, the safety chains, chains have a class rating too. You're not going to, unless you really know chains, you're not going to find it. Um, but you could always replace them with chains that you know are rated for what you're doing. Uh, again, the guys that, 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 that haul commercially, they're, you know, sometimes I'll call them trucker chains or whatever, but they, they're class rated and they would never use a crap. Well, they should never use a crappy chain to, you know, pull down a 15,000 piece of equipment on the back of a trailer. They know the difference, but mm -hmm. you might go to the hardware store and go, I need a, I need a chain. I just need something long enough. So yeah. it's all rated on. Yeah. Okay. Kim was Emily. saying, see if I worded this correctly, would this be an example of a two inch versus three inch receiver? My parents Dodge 3,500 truck has a shim for the installed receiver. This allows the bumper pull receiver to fit correctly. My parents truck was previously used as a hauling truck. So it has heavier springs installed in the rear. Is that, did yeah. she? Okay. She's got it. Um, and, and what the, like mine has a two and a half, mine has a two and a half. And so I have to use a, a sleeve, a sleeve down to two mm -hmm. for a typical, and I could buy a two and a half, um, ball mount without the sleeve, but they weigh a ton and I don't need it. I just, so I just, and then like I said, I saw a Ford not too long ago with the three inch, uh, those, those bigger, um, receiver sizes, the two and a half or three are designed for hitches that are for like these pinhole type 
that's on the trailer, like a ring. And then okay. I don't know if I have a, and then that's what go, would be on the back of your truck. It's like a claw. How crazy. And, and you see it with those, um, if you look at, you know, those big yellow heavy equipment trailers that are pulling backhoes, yeah. if you happen to look at how they're hooked, they're hooked with that panel ring. They don't have a ball mount. Like the ball would just, the ball couldn't handle right. 23,000 pounds of stuff. So they use that. And, and my dad joke of the night is I, I guess the trailer manufacturers decided if they liked it, they should have put a ring on it. So that's what they did. Okay. So right. enough of, enough of <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah no that's good because if, if i mean if, if if you look at the truck and you go well it's got a two and a half inch uh receiver then it's got a heavier hitch it's got a heavier hitch that the manufacturer mm -hmm. put on it's because a truck is capable ish of carrying more weight than a, a smaller truck there's no standard though for those weights remember we're talking about whether or not the driver's included or whether or not fuel is included manufacturers have never come to an agreement on publishing that information one way or the other. Okay. And in 2013, they tried and they made this standard, but the marketing guys were like, no, 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 do it without the driver. You know? Right. So we're, you know, we say we got the biggest towing capacity of anybody. It, it's, it's a game. So you got to learn what yours is or just go very mm -hmm. conservative and assume that everything is coming off of whatever that, whatever that towing number or payload number is. You know, we talked about payload, but if you look at the towing numbers, it's the same kind of deal. It will say trailer weight, 13,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. right, deduct for the hitch, deduct, right? You know, mm -hmm. for whatever else is in the bed of the truck, deduct for the drive. And, and I venture to say that if, 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 if you went to a typical horse competition where there's 50 trucks and trailers, that 20% of them are overweight, if not mm -hmm. more that are like legally overweight for what that truck can do in that trailer, the way they're loaded and the way they're equipped and how mm -hmm. they're being used. And that's why I thought it was important to talk about it a little bit yeah. because if, if it, you know, it's not on a lot of people's radar to even worry about that stuff. bumper pulls. Yeah. You can see where people are just loading stuff in, in the truck. Maybe usually it's older trucks or older trailers. Yeah. And, and, and the bumper pull is really a good example because that's also, also makes it extremely hard to drive when yeah. you do it. Yeah. There's no doubt the goosenecks are more forgiving. I've got this fun little toy I bought because I'm a geek that way. This is a, a ball that you can put on your hitch, uh, your, your ball mount, and put your trailer on. It has a gauge, and it will tell you your tongue weight. What? That's, That's cool. Really cool. Isn't that cool? I did it because I wasn't sure about a trailer we had, and I'm like, I'll just go buy one of these things and see. It's a toy. And you yeah. can leave it on, but I never would. But, but it's kind of – oh, sorry. It, it's kind of cool. Um, to have that, especially if you play with different trailers, because you, you can get an idea. But again, kind of cool to see it fully loaded, though. Like put everything on my trailer, my horse, everything, and then see what it hits as the tongue weight. And and, and the, right yeah, yeah. for tongue weight, because then that's where you might go. Hey, I'm going to move this. You know, like on a some of the bumper pull trailers have like an A-frame, mm -hmm. and I've seen like really heavy generators mounted on those A-frames, or maybe sometimes that's where the cooler goes. Yeah, it's just like, yeah. ah, you know, horizontal space is a premium, right? I'm going to strap <laughs> this thing right on. But you're, you're, as you can imagine, the leverage of that being right on the, right yeah. behind the hit, the hitch itself, it's going to add something to it. I never even thought about it though. Yeah. See, see that's why I kind of like hay pods in, in, in like goosenecks because they're in the back, granted, they're behind the wheels, but mm -hmm. all that hay doesn't weigh as much as a couple of ponies, but it's not going over the front of the trailer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's what it is. Right. The idea right. is like it's a really good place to throw a little bit of weight that isn't going to mess you up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's a, no. So and you're right. I've seen so many people mount things right between, like on that little frame, right between in the very front of the bumper pull trailers. Like, yeah. We'll See, here's mine. That at one point. Yeah. yeah. That's my little sundowner, and there's not a whole lot of room there. But if I was carrying a generator, I might be tempted to strap it on there. Exactly. Yeah. And you don't and even think gonna... about how much more weight I'm throwing on it because of wear. And by the way, look at how pretty that thing is is uh, sitting nice and level. Nice. It and almost level. look. It almost looks low. But the, the yeah. you want them level or a tad low-ish, but not high. You don't want them mm -hmm. high. Mm -hmm. So that one's 
just the way, the I was way about I did to that mention one. that because I've seen those people that have their trucks jacked up and then they strap a trailer to it. You can see that the trailer's like hanging in yep. the back. Oh, and, and also wanted, because I'm trying to go back on last week a little bit. And I know I'm jumping all over the place, but we talked about, I was saying how easy it was to raise a lot of these, these gooseneck trailers up so that the back end is up. And my bison's like that. It, it They did it really right. They bought new axles. It's a 2011 and then the axle stickers are 2015. I guess they went to a trailer dealer and they said, we need this higher for our truck. Mm -hmm. And they just swapped out axles with axles wow. that are designed. They're perched differently. You can't do it any better than that. If you're going to raise yeah. it because the axles designed for that. So when, when I was saying, you know, it's not a big deal. It's just a couple hundred bucks of parts. That is true. Uh, part of it depends on what kind of axle you have. There's two basic kinds of axles in, in trailers. Um, again, just, just ballpark thing here but th those are spring axles Le they have the leaf springs like your truck has mm -hmm. you see how they have this the the springs here yeah all right what can be done is that's called an underslung axle where the spring is under the the axle oh, what I can see. be done is it can be moved to up here where it's overslung oh. and that will get you that that this this you know four inches six inches, whatever that is but I don't recommend doing that without talking to getting the axle information and checking with the manufacturer. A lot of them sell those parts and it requires, you can just flip them over like that. But when you, when you, when you reverse the, the, the keeper for the, the, the spring, usually they recommend tack welding it to the top of the axle. Cause it was welded at the bottom. Not okay. everybody does that. They just do it in their backyard. They're like, Oh, we're just going to flip it. One thing I'll tell you never to do, Never, ever, 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 ever flip an axle over. If it has the mounting and you say, well, I'm just going to literally take the axle off and rotate, rotate it. it. Because axles, a lot of axles have a bit of an arc to them. You ever see a tractor trailer going down the road and the bed is like arced? Well, that's because mm -hmm. when the weight, yeah. you know, and like, so the trailers are the same way. Sometimes they, they're they not completely flat axles. A lot of them are, but it's some of them aren't. Yeah. So if you flip them, now you got to go in the wrong way. It's easier just okay. to get a hold of the manufacturer and go, hey, I want to, I, I need to raise this one. Um, I think Kenny had some experience with this because these are spring shackles on a um, uh, leaf spring trailer. And I took that picture for two reasons. One, to show you how many moving parts there are and they have to stay lubricated. Mm -hmm. um, these little bushings in here are supposed to kind of help eliminate the need for grease because they're, they're synthetic. I mean, it's really hard to grease these things anyway. But when these bushings wear out, which they do, then you've got metal on metal and it won't last long. Um, but I saw this picture of one that was broken. And I think I remember Kenny posting something on Facebook about fixing one that had had broken off. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. And, and a lot of times that happens because they're not lubricated anymore um, and they bind. And then sometimes it's because of weight. And, you know, you can buy them in a kit. You can have your local trailer mechanic guy just replace all that stuff with okay. fresh. And I've done it. Um, it's not a big deal. There, there's a couple things you can do with. Um, oh, and here's an example of, of one of those kits I was talking about. This is for a torsion axle, but it's literally just like blocks that you put to raise your trailer off your axle. And you can oh. buy that kit. So th there's no sense like reinventing the wheel. I right. think that thing's like, that's like a hundred and whatever. It seems like a lot for what you're getting, but you're getting really good hardware, like, like, like grade eight bolts. And, um, it's designed to do it. And the manufacturer says it's okay. And that's probably the biggest reason to do it. Yeah. Um, I was trying to find if I could real quickly. Okay. Um, I thought Kenny would like this too. The, the, the bolts that go through the spring shackles. Um, mm -hmm. here's, I like to use these if you can find them for your thing because they have grease fittings on the end of them and it has like a hole. So you put that on and then you can fill it with grease kind of like, like, like the trailer buddy axle things and the grease gets out into the, the pivot areas. Um, if you, if you ever install one of them, they're serrated on the end because mm -hmm. they're not supposed to spin. I saw a trailer manufacturer, uh, trailer supply website where the guy took an impact and he spun it off while he was holding the nut. And all he did was destroy the serrations and also probably destroy the, the, the part of the trailer, uh, the, the, the spring mount where that goes in. So the new one's just going to spin. 
Like you got to hold that and you got to take the nut off. Don't spin the serrated part. And that, oh, and the other thing about that is like, if you're doing that too, there's a hole and mm -hmm. that's where the grease comes out. Don't, you got to index it. You don't want that hole straight down because you have all the weight of all the hardware on it and the hole is being mushed. And then when you put the grease in, it can't get out. So, you know, okay. you can either do it left, right, or up. Right. But I see that mistake made all the time too, where that where, where they don't think about which way the, the hole is going and they go to load it with grease and it really doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And again, right. it doesn't, and it's not supposed to spin. Um, so, so to uh, find ahead. out that your trailer needs these things like replaced or updated, I guess your recommendation for someone like Genevieve and I would be find a great trailer guy. And how often should we be taking our trailer to our great trailer guy? Well, I thought about that after the other night and I'm just going to pop that up. I think that's what Kenny, Kenny went through one of those. I think he replaced that for somebody where it broke off at the top. And, yeah, and uh, I'm pretty sure I saw a post about that, but I you see those not. Too. All right. So look at this thing. Look up, look how nasty this thing is. Yeah. Because you know that that's, that's not moving with all that rust inside the frame. That's yeah. not moving. And more than likely, the pivot point was seized up too. So, yeah. but to answer your question, and I thought about that a little bit, because I think somebody had asked that the other night. We didn't, really didn't get into it enough. Um, if it were me, because somebody said about how often do you grease wheel bearings? You know, like, if it were me, because we want peace of mind and we don't want to deal with this stuff, I would do it preseason every year. Okay. Okay. It's not, a, I mean, you find a good guy that will, will spend, you know, an hour or two, whatever. It doesn't take long. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've even got somebody who's not a, you know, paid mechanic that you really trust, who's willing to do it for a case of beer or something. Um, just make sure they know what they're doing. But yeah. um, you, that needs to be looked at because usually it's not looked at until you hear a noise or something's not right. And then you're kind of in trouble. Right. Um, you guys want to go and come back without, right, without having to... Um, any issues. Yeah. Be on the side of the road and then call the guy and go, Hey, I got some leftover beer. If you don't mind driving two and a half hours to where I'm stuck on the road. And uh, the beer's not going to cut it at that point. <laughs> no. Um, and, and going back to the ratings for a minute, trailer hitch, it trailer hitch devices have class ratings on them. Mm -hmm. But look at, look at the variance. If I go, Oh, I got a class four hitch on my truck. Well, which one, <laughs> you know, they're not yeah, all the that's same. Crazy. That's a wide look at, range. Look at the, the ranges. The ranges are yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, if you if you do the um, we, we, I want to try to get to one other. I'm, I'm I don't know. I'm bouncing all over the place. And I apologize. But if you okay. do the spring bars, or you're interested in having these these weight distributing bars put on your trailer, which absolutely they're. I mean, in my mind, they're magic. They're they're just crazy. Yeah. how good they do but you have to have a hitch capable uh, a hitch receiver capable of doing it you have to buy a new hitch because it has to have the mounting pieces for the bars mm -hmm. you have to attach the bar part to your trailer so if you don't want to drill a hole in your trailer it may not be for you mm -hmm. but um all of this stuff comes extra the bars themselves are rated and how thick they are is for how heavy your trailer is and it needs to match. Imagine if you had like the wrong spring on something like, I don't know, take for example, like a, like a big pen and you had some crazy spring on it. You couldn't even push your thumb on it to make it go. Well, if you put the really heavy um, springs on a lighter trailer, it doesn't act right at all. It, it's just horrible. The same way if you go the other way. So you want you you look at them. They've got numbers, and again, it ranges. But you want to be on the proper one. Um, it's a wonderful upgrade. I'm gonna show you one other thing about it too. Um, is what it does. A lot of people see them and they're like, oh yeah, sway bars. You know, that's gonna help keep the trailer from swaying. What it does some of that, but what it really does, and and, and I'm gonna probably not describe this as well as I could. The way these bars are under a tremendous amount of tension when the trailer's uh, on the on the ball, mm -hmm. and they're actually able to cause the truck not to sag as much because it transfers weight all the way, not just here, all the way to the front axles of the truck, and at the same time transfers weight back to the axles on your trailer. Wow, so the, the middle that it's creating. 
Yeah, it's like it's like a lift. It it's just lifts up, yeah. the middle up. But what it does not do is lower your your tongue weight. It actually okay. adds a few hundred pounds to your trailer axles, and it adds some weight to the front of your truck, but it takes some weight off of the back. Right, and that's really really why people like them, and and that's why you'll see um, you'll see the ratings go up so much higher with weight distributing. Um, the number the numbers are just depending on the situation on the situation. The numbers are wonderful. So, like a lot of times, for example, after this discussion, if somebody was to go out and look at their 1998 suburban with the four horse bumper pull steel trailer and go, ooh, well. Look, do the research. What do we, what would it be if you put that weight distributing on? Would it help get you under mm -hmm. where you need to be? Because it can. Mm -hmm. It can. You just have to understand how it adds weight in different places. The weight doesn't go away. Yeah. Right. But it creates a better stability. Um, they're a pain to put on. Like nobody likes doing them. You got to have, remember Carly, we were talking about that long bar yes. that you put over the wrench. You got to have like this bar to, Put like them on crank them up and uh, yeah and and when i did mine I, I don't have a bumper pull that needs it now but when i did mine i kind of cheated a little bit i would not lower the ball all the way and then i would put it on, them and, then on. Drop and then it i'd down. lower it and let the trailer do the work you know <laughs> and, and once you know how long your chains are supposed to be you can actually do that um it's not because you got it's repetitive it's always going to hook up pretty much yeah. the same way um now i'm thinking about boat trailers and stuff and then thinking about coming into the next competition season. Is there anything people should do to winterize in any way at end of season when it's going to be sitting for a while? And what should people be looking to have done as they gear up for the season to start back up? Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, re that's really good because there's a couple things and having a large motor home, I go through this kind of stuff too. You know, it doesn't travel all the time. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few things. The covers that you can put on tires that you see on campers and RVs, it helps get some of the UV of the sun off of those tires. And, and definitely, I think that's beneficial. Um, a nice heavy trailer tire is your friend because some tires, if you let a vehicle sit for months, right, they get a little bit like Lucky. this. So <laughs> yeah, when I drive my motor home after it's been sitting forever, I feel like it's just doing this until the like tires warm up. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, flat spots itself. Um, some people try different things. They'll overinflate them, underinflate them, jack them up. I mean, jacking them up certainly an option, especially on a, on a trailer. Get it off the ground. Mm -hmm. One, if you're parking it in the grass or somewhere, then maybe you're keeping some of the the water and the snow that's running around it off of there. So raising them up is is a possibility. I don't, I don't really I've never really researched whether it would help to to run them down or run them up on air pressure, mm -hmm. um, but that and then um, let's see. I'm not a fan of like when people put those big covers over their campers. Like they, 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 yeah, have you ever seen, and I'm going yeah. to campers, but the same thing happens with boats and I've seen it even on horse trailers. Condensation is just a problem. I yeah. honestly think yeah. it, it, in the my mind, reason. let it heat and cool and do it and air out and do what it's going to do. I mean, if you can yeah. get it under a, a lean to or a shed, absolutely. Um, yeah. Sadly, there's not a whole lot you can do with big, heavy trailers to get them out of the weather. Um, yeah, but, but that would be something I, I think maybe, maybe the most extreme version of that might be if you know, you're not going to use it to jack it up and, and set it on something so that the tires aren't touching the ground. Mm -hmm. um, okay. uh, if anybody else has any ideas of what they do, chime yeah. in. Cause I'm, I mean, what I about keep, getting, like, I'm stall vents. So for someone like me, whose driveway isn't even large enough to park, like both of our vehicles, uh -huh. we have a boat and we have a horse trailer sitting out in our grass. That's the only place we have for it. But we have these stall mats handy. Would it benefit us to just go ahead and put the stall mats underneath the truck or the trailer in, in the boat? Or would that just be like a waste of effort? We should just no, sell them. I, no, them. I, I like that. I, I like that idea. Okay. And, and especially like if you're parking them in the grass or the mud. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really, I mean, I do storage, so people bring boats and jet skis and stuff to me and store them. And as much as they hate to pay for it, they know they'll be like, man, this is going to last me longer because it's indoors. Yeah. I'm so glad right. it's not out in the weather. So right. honestly, if you could find a storage place, oh, and especially one where you can come and get it is you want, I usually, my winter storage, I tell them, bring it in, put it to sleep, 
don't call me every three weeks because you want to start the engine. I mean, no, you know, like, like yeah. we'll, we'll mothball it for you, but we don't want the traffic in and out, but it is a, re- that's a really good way, especially for something like a boat. Cause you, I mean, I know Tommy uses it probably more than most boat owners use their yeah. boat. All, yeah. the time. all year seen, round. So I've seen neighbors where their boats are literally sinking into the ground or they're, uh, you know what I mean? They just never move them. They mow like around six them. months a year. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, so indoor storage would be best or even under, under a, you know, cover like a canopy or something. Yeah. 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 But don't wrap them. I don't like, I don't like wrapping them up. I, I just, you know, that's interesting um, thinking about even just covering the tires though, to keep the sun off of it. You know, if yeah. it's going to be sitting out, it's yeah. I hadn't even thought about how it would impact the tires, just having it sit and let it get wet and frozen and everything else. Oh, you honestly, you can tell like if, if, where we live, one side of my trailer gets all the sun and the other side doesn't. And I mm-hmm. see all kinds of stuff on that side. Yeah. The molding gets dry or the tires look funky or there's nothing good about that side except for if we have condensation, it burns off quicker yeah. with the sun. Yeah. But yeah, it's very one-sided at our house. And it's almost like, well, every three months, and it kind of most of my, it turn around, yeah. yeah. But I, I keep most of my stuff inside. I have a nice big building, so like even mm-hmm. the the thirty four foot motorhome is inside. But you know, most of my stuff is, but but some of it I can't. Um, but yeah, it, it kind of that depends too. Do not, oh man, do not, do not, do not, do not park them under these evergreen trees, and and stuff. Um, get them out away from leaves and pine needles and things that will fall down out of the sky and <laughs> land on it. And I'm trying to go back to the, the one I just bought and it has sat for like five years in this, the guy kind of lived in the, his, his aunt lived in the woods. And I was like, oh, are you kidding me? I mean, when I walked up to it, it was just green moss and nothing a pressure washer won't fix. Right. Yeah. But on the other hand, I know I should have a picture of somewhere here. It cleaned up beautifully, but it was a lot of work and it's, it's kind of hard on, hard on trailers. It's hard on the paint. It's hard on everything. Um, mm-hmm. If you let it do that. And and I don't know if I've got, cause I climbed up on the, I climbed up on the roof to take a picture of it for the guy that I was buying it from. Cause I'm like, have you looked up there? No. I said, this thing <laughs> is <laughs> bad, man. Um, but I don't well, okay, you're not going to see much, but you can just see how like that air conditioner is just covered with crap, and you oh, can yeah. see all the trees around it. You know, yeah. I and mean, that's really not a, not a great example of the picture. Um, but don't, if you can do it, get it out kind of in the open, right? Let the sun get to it. Let the uh, keep keep stuff from falling on it. Um, that that just it just kills them, especially if you have an awning. Yeah. You know, and it's rolled up and all yeah. that stuff or a slide out with the small cover. So yeah. that would be. Now, right. Okay. It's sat for five months through the winter and people are gearing up to go to the first MA in April or, you know, pairs competition. What should they be looking for as they bring their square tires out into use again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're going to, you're going to look at that. You're going to keep track of the date codes and you're going to know if this is the year that you're going to have to swap them out. And obviously I'm not buying tires in October. I'm buying tires in, in, in March. You know, I want that mm-hmm. six months or whatever mm-hmm. um, in my favor. And then have somebody remember, we're talking about shaking the, the, the wheel. Did either yeah. of y'all, y'all were all ready to go out and shake those tires. The next day. Yeah. Did anybody do it? Um, but, but you want to, you, you want to make sure the wheel bearings are good. So again, if you find, if you find a good shop, a trailer shop or mechanic, and you're like, Hey, I need, and it, it's an easy, it's an easy list, right? You want to check your hitch mechanism and make sure it's working properly. Cause again, bumper pulls that stuff rusts up or it gets dented or damaged. Uh, goosenecks are a little bit more forgiving because they sit under the canopy so they don't take as much weather um and then you want to have pull the wheels and check the brakes now brake pads on trailers are really thin that's why you have to be sure you have somebody who knows what they're doing is familiar with it because a lot of times if you pull even brand new brake pads some mechanics Mm -hmm. would say oh they're worn out well they're never as thick as car pads they're just not designed that way they're pretty thin to begin with but you want to check that the pads are decent 
and well, the shoes, I'm, I'm calling them pads. That's, that's wrong. The brake shoes are, are not as thick um, on, on, on trailers. So you want to make sure that they're decent and that the mechanism works with, with drum brakes. There's like all kinds of things that slide and springs mm -hmm. and from sitting, they can rust up where they don't work. And I don't know if y'all even are really familiar, probably not with how trailer brakes work. They're a little bit different. They have like this magnet, right? This is why they're electric brakes. And when, when you apply the brake, the magnet sticks to the drum. And then the shoes go like this, right? So all that stuff has to be operating properly. And the magnets can wear themselves through the face where they have holes in them. Oh, so, wow. yeah, I mean, a 20, 30 year old trailer, you, sh you should expect that stuff really. So have yeah. somebody look at it. And, and the thing is, none of those parts are really expensive and they're not a big deal for mo most mechanics or even, you know, uh, halfway handy people at home to do, but somebody has to look. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and then again, I'm big on the frames, get under there, have them look at it, make sure nothing has happened. We didn't really get into anything electrical, but trailer electrical wiring generally is not very good. And it's not really, really, I don't like the way they use the connectors and that stuff tends to go bad over time. Right. right. So not only do you plug it in and check it, you wiggle a few things and make sure that the connections are good, mm -hmm. you know, um, on that subject. Okay, and then let's see. So we were checking the frame, the brakes, the tires, the hitch. Make sure the lights work. Um, on that note, I took a picture of something the other day because this is what a lot of people do and it was why I ended up spending some time at MA's repairing trailer plugs. Definitely um, not us. <laughs> no, no. And, and I want to find it because I'm like, yeah, this is, the, this is a good example. I just got it. Oh, man. I know I had it here somewhere. Um, what do you do with your trailer plug when you, um, yeah. What do you do with your trailer plug when you unhook your trailer and you're done and you've got the electric plug? Um, wrap it up and then I hook it underneath the tongue. Cause I have a gooseneck and then it's just, it hangs like down, but it's not near like the weather or anything unless the rain is like pouring in sideways. <laughs> okay. How about you, Jen? I have definitely tied it so that it's sticking straight up because it felt like it looked pretty. <laughs> um, here's the deal. This this is this is a good one. Um, what's wrong with that one? Mm. It's under the A-frame, so maybe it's protected. Do you see the problem with it? It's like dangling too far down. I don't know. Yeah. It's also like all caught up in the chains. Oh, that's and the okay. wire, the brake wire thing there is is in the chains uh, too. Yeah. All that's right, good for this, for this there. discussion. It's straight it's, down. It looks okay. It's straight down. So any water that gets on that cable yeah. is going to run down into the connector. Into the connector. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, I so, guess that makes sense. Yeah. Cause right. Kind of, okay. Yep. I mean, it's just yeah. going to, it's just going to, and it does, it, it will just run. Um, yeah. Not to, not to get too geeky, but when you, when, when like we install cable or, any, anything on like an outside building. Yeah, there you go. Um, Linda Linda's had it. Got it. But like when you look at your house, if the, the telephone guy or the cable guy did it right, it go, where it goes into the house, mm -hmm. there's a thing called a drip loop. It goes oh. down and up into the house. So the water runs down the wire and drips. It doesn't run down it into, the run house. Straight into the house. <sighs> drip loop. So it's the same theory with this it's like you, you, you don't want it sticking straight up if it's yeah. going to be exposed but if you put it down you may think that you're doing something but, but it the water water has a way of getting into stuff um and then of course there's this one um at a recent event not to be named which by the way jen thanks for your coaching but i found this one outside <laughs> Not yours. Oh, wow. But yeah. Not yours. So, so like, yeah. the, the cool thing about this one, the reason why I took a picture of it is this is a plus because we talked about that. Yep. Yeah. yeah. But then this, this laying okay. in, in the, in the weather is not oh, so much. the water to run around it. Yeah. Right. Okay. They make a thing. I don't know if I have a picture of it, but they make, and, and, and I buy, you know, I buy like five packs of these things and put them on trailers when I have them. It, it's a fake plug. Or a fake you receptacle time that you like plug into to help. And it, it just so you hang it upside down and just plug it in and it holds the wire, but it's covered because it's kind of like a socket. And I, like I thought that. I took a picture of one. And you can buy them; those are great. Uh, don't do sandwich bags and all that because inevitably, no matter where you lay it or how you think you have oh, it, gravity will. 
yeah, you'll end up filling, like filling the bag up or something um, <laughs> with, with water. And then it will sit there for like, what, all, all winter full of, yeah. full of water. Um, trailer connectors are not made very well. There are some ones that are better than others, but generally speaking, they're, they're, they're not very good. They're cheap plastic. And um, so, um, you know, if you can protect that, get it. Important. Yeah. One, one thing that people will do, and again, it, you don't have to take this thing with you or you can put it in your, uh, in your trailer is you can take like a little box and cut like a little groove in it, throw the trailer in the sh- thing and shut it. So just the wires going into the box, it, like a little, okay. not yeah. to date myself, but like the old floppy disc boxes from way <laughs> back and y'all don't even know what I'm talking about, but you know, some just little box, right? Yeah. That, but, but the idea is you, you want gravity to go away from the connector with the water mm-hmm. and you want the connector end to be secured. Um, and, and yeah, I, we had a question about paint. That was interesting. Linda, what is the best product to clean slash remove oxidation of the paint on aluminum trailers? And Kimberly, similar, speaking of trailer paint, how can we maintain and protect the trailer paint? So I assume you're talking about like a white trailer, not a yes. shiny aluminum trailer. Yeah, it's something that actually was painted. They have similar trailer to mine. And when you just like wipe the side or even like bump into the side, then your clothes are Chalk. now just with this chalky whiteness. It's chalky. And it's yeah. Gross. And and sadly, um, the aluminum on trailers, the paint is really thin. Mm. So you have to be careful. Mm-hmm. Again, this at your own risk, but this is what I do. Um, and I did it to the new one I bought. And I'm like, yeah, this is working. Um, there's a stuff you can buy like at the dollar store and okay. it's yellow and it's called LA's awesome cleaner. Okay. It's really a cheesy name. It almost reminds me of something you'd see Billy Mays trying to sell at mm-hmm. two in the morning on some cable <laughs> channel, but it's, I think it's citrus based. It's pretty harmless. And mm-hmm. what I do, you don't want to rub. You really don't want to rub that, that paint. Cause it's thin. The chalkiness sometimes is going to happen, but like the one that I did, you get a bug sprayer. And get the one, like if you go to Lowe's, get the one designed for chemicals, like for bleach, because they the rubber parts won't go bad. And you put some of the LAs in it, and you mix it with water, and then you pump it up. And then you just spray the side of the trailer, and you let it kind of run down a little bit. And then I use a pressure washer. You can do it with a garden hose, certainly. Um, mm-hmm. But then you just knock that off, and you... You can take a, a a soft sponge and give it a quick rub or a brush, a really soft bristle brush, uh-huh. but you don't want to be hard on them. You don't want to rub them and then just do that and then just rinse them. The hardest thing to get off of white painted trailers, especially in living quarters, are the streaks. And that yeah. LA stuff does a really good job yeah. with the black streaks. Um, okay. You can wax them or you can put a protective coating on them. But to do that, you got to get all the chalk off. You got to be okay. sure that, you know, um, and I, I normally don't do that, although I did th- this new one I bought. I'm really trying to do some stuff with it. And I think I did it to the bison because I'm selling it, uh, which, by the way, 2011 bison, three quarter, uh, uh, three horse slant load, living quarters, everything, 25,000 can be yours. Pick up the phone. Give me a call. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, <laughs> um, there was a, um, oh, I have to look. Now, if, if I ever come on again or I'll text it to you. Um, I bought something that was supposed to be kind of a protectant, but it was a spray on protectant. I'm not mm-hmm. waxing and buffing. Yeah. 27 feet. The entire thing. Yeah. Right. Not doing it. Um, yeah. But I think that that would be the thing that the LA is so that and rinse it off and try not to be too harsh on it. Um, it also kind of works good on aluminum too. And on that note with aluminum, be very, very careful The the whole acid washing thing that everybody did back in the day, Nobody really does that anymore, except for way up in the industrial world. And okay. oftentimes what happens is your trailer is a mix of, of uh, what we call like, like, like mill finish aluminum, which is just that kind of dullish, like mm-hmm. aluminum and paint. And they mm-hmm. acid the whole thing. Now you're aciding the paint. You don't want gotcha. acid the paint. Yeah. So we kind of don't, I, I mean, I don't do that anymore. I, I um, this, if you, if you're trying to get aluminum shiny, I, I still, I'm still using that. My, my off camera hand over here grabbing something. Um, if you're, um, if you're trying to clean the aluminum, like your fenders on your, your mm-hmm. white trailer with your thing, um, there's this stuff called Aluma clean and it's kind of expensive and it is acidic. So it goes on 
You don't rub. It foams, and mm-hmm. then you rinse it off. And you don't okay. leave it on there too long. Okay. Um, again, I, I love the bug sprayer because you, you mix it, and then you pump it up, and then you're just spritzing it on. Yeah. You're not doing the spray bottle thing and all that. Much easier. <laughs> Um, but if you looked at like, I don't know, I sent you those pictures of the, the, if you look at the bison those mm-hmm. and my, my little trailer that I just did, those fenders are like nice because it, it, will, yeah. it, it will cut through that, all the crap that's on it and not hurt anything Yeah, because aluminum, basically you clean it with a little bit of acidic, whatever, and then it, it will oxidize again down the road. Mm-hmm. But that whole all over spray of acid, especially over mm-hmm. the paint. That's where the, sometimes that's where the chalking can come from too. So, so I was okay. thinking too, having a white spotty horse that when I bathe him and I throw him in our trailer with the aluminum, like the slant slats for the slant load when they close and he's rubbing up against it, he'll get these big black marks on his side. Is there something yeah. I can do to help prevent that by cleaning it maybe? Or is he just always I mean, going to have stripes? Well, <laughs> spots? you're going to... I think you're going to have that pretty much all the time. You can try cleaning it before you, like if you know you're going away, you could try cleaning it. So the oxidation doesn't come back until maybe you come back. But honestly, that's a whole lot of work. So um, we use like sheets it. on the ponies <laughs> or whatever. We just kind of work around it. Yeah. And it's easier to do that. I think. I didn't know if it Alu- meant that I wasn't doing something I should do, I guess. No, because no, yeah. aluminum oxidizes just, it, it it's going to do that. And it, sometimes it can do that really quickly. So okay. it's almost impossible to keep up with it. And I agree with you. I hate that Carly. Same thing when you, when you brush against something and you get the chalk all over you. Yes. It's so yeah. annoying. Yeah. Like I definitely want to try to make my trailer look pretty this year as well as functional. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then, um, Treat it. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're, what, what I want to talk about a little bit, if we have time, are we yep. going over? Yeah. Are we okay? Oh, got, or you tell me. Got maybe 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to move a little bit to the using those same weights with your trailer and, and thinking about not overloading your trailer. Okay. Mm-hmm. The, find the manufacturer sticker. So you know what the most it can carry and just assume that's what you're going to do. Look at how much you have to deduct from that based on the, the, the tack that you keep in the trailer, anything you've added to it, that foot locker full of stuff. Right. And those numbers will, those numbers will, the, the capacity will, drop but the weight will increase and that's really the key that's okay. really the key and and yes you can go over your maximum trailer weight pretty easily with a whole lot of gear beyond your trailer so i guess in a way to, to summarize that is to like i said earlier go to the scales and and get an idea of what you're doing with your truck and trailer on a normal ma day you know you, you could you could weigh it on your way out on friday it only takes a minute Mm-hmm. Uh, you pay. You have to go through twice, I guess, really, depending on what you want to do. But you don't have to unhook it because it's not that important to know how much your trailer weighs empty. It's important to know what you're doing when you're headed down the road. So mm-hmm. hit the scales and get that. Um, you may be surprised, especially, again, back in the bumper pull world where I see people pulling, I mean, even all the way down into the forerunners and the little Yukons, you know, the stuff that's not even considered normally something you would use to tow with, they will tow. And, and on that note, I, I want to make sure I got this in too. All these numbers we're talking about, we're talking about torque and horsepower and all that. You hear it said all the time. It is absolutely true. You still have to stop. Right. Which is another reason why you don't want to be up on the upper edge of those numbers, even if it says it can do it. Because that there's an assumption that, that everything's working like it should. Your, your trailer brake is adjusted properly. The brakes are good on the trailer. The truck is good. That There's no issues. And even then, has anybody... And, and and maybe in the last minute, if we could, if anybody wants to chime in with one of their towing horror stories about what it was like to drive and have something go wrong. And I'm going to tell you mine, because it happened coming back from, from uh, three clovers the other day. So yeah. we're pulling the little, yes. And, and this is why you never know. We're pulling that. We got the, the two horse bumper pull with two ponies in it and yeah. some stuff. Alice and I in the truck and the truck can carry five of those trailers. Yeah. Uh, good tires right? Inflated in the rear to the max, like they should be. And when you come off 70 onto 68, there's a sharp turn and it's all broken up and they keep patching it with this really slippery stuff. And it was raining. You remember how it was raining? Mm -hmm. And and I drive and I'm going to, I'm going to spend my last four minutes mentioning a couple ways to drive, but I drive like we drove in racing. You pretend that you have an egg between your foot and the pedal. There's none of this going on in my driving with in a normal day, but especially with trailers, everything's gentle. 
Everything's easy. It's better for the ponies. I don't know if y'all ever do that. You slam on the brakes and you kind of go, I'm sorry, ponies. You know, yes. like you talk to them, <laughs> but, but you know, we try to do like, I, I'm a very smooth and easy driver. Anyway, we're going around that turn and we're not speeding and I'm not trying to accelerate through the corner. Like yeah. I do. I'm just kind of just taking it through and it broke. And the truck went like that. And the trailer went like that. And Alice freaked. Oh my God. And, but fortunately, because I, I just, I did a correction and Didn't straightened panic. it out and we kept on going. And she's like, I would erect it. I know I would erect it. Like it oh, just came out of nowhere. And, and this is equipment that's all set up properly, but the road yeah. was, was bouncy and they used that, that patch that's really slippery. Yeah. So moral of that story is two hands on the wheel. Make sure you know what you're doing. You can feel it. Like when you ride a pony, you can feel it. Uh, don't, don't get distracted. Don't, cause that in that moment, had I turned the wheel the wrong way or done something wrong and there was a car in the lane next, yeah. next to us, it would have been really bad, but luckily it was just, it was, it was a natural reaction yeah. to, to counter out of it. And, and with that note, most people overcorrect. And it's called a snapback. You're going this way and they put too much in and then it hooks and up. It shoots back. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know what happened. I was headed towards a median and I ended up in the shoulder. Well, yeah, that's all experience. Um, it takes time to become comfortable driving the snow and get used to sliding around. It's a good thing. It almost actually, feels you... like a topic for another episode. Yeah. 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 About yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, driving, but can... learning to drive and learning to park. Yeah, yeah. If I could give anybody some advice on, on, on a good way to kind of like drive your truck and trailer, it, one would be to drive like you have an egg under your foot. Be gentle, right? Like mm -hmm. you ride. You don't shopping cart your pony and do all that. <laughs> uh, the second thing is, and, and I could probably, ra I can wrap this in like a minute and a half, I promise. Um, the second thing is use your mirrors. Know where the vehicles are around you all yeah. the time. Always know. You should never, if 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 you had, and, and with trucks and trailers, you're not just generally going to jump lanes if you, you know, like you would in your little car, but you need to know. What's there? And every now and then I'll be like, what happened to that gray car? I know there was a gray car there. Well, now he's on my bumper. He's this far away. Yeah. Like he was there. He's gone. So where is he? Um, with that. And so be aware, look up. If you look over the nose at the car in front of you, when they hit their brakes, you'll hit your brakes. But if you can right. see three cars ahead, I, I've never done a venting or jumping or cross country, but I would imagine it works better if you look ahead a little bit, right? <laughs> Right. You know, and not just look over your jump and not yeah. know where your next jump. So it's the same idea. Look up. So if three cars ahead of you, that guy touches his brakes, you might lift and not touch your brake to take, but be ready. Keep that yeah. slack going. And yeah. if you're looking over the thing, you're going to, if, if the guy in front of you is doing this, you're doing this. Right. So yeah. look up, look around, look at your mirrors, right? Drive gentle, smooth on your foot, smooth on the brakes. If you get in a panic situation, then all bets are off. Don't try to, you know, one of the things about like, like, like with, with, if a deer jumps out, I, I, I'm kind of committed. If I'm in a big truck and trailer, if a deer comes out, I'm either going to be the hammer or the nail, but I'm not going to, there's no way I'm going to do just this. Just go. Yeah, exactly. And flip, yeah. Th things like that. Um, just think about smoothness and, and looking up and not playing with your phone and not forgetting to check your mirrors. And when that idiot's riding next to you, right where your tires are, mm -hmm. right? If mm -hmm. he comes over and smacks your trailer, you're going to have an issue. So if you know somebody's okay. there, think about, well, maybe I'll just speed up a little bit. Try to not let him hang there. Create some distance. Yeah. Don't let people hang next to you like that. If you get a blowout, right. I mean, it, it just like, and people are dumb. Right. So like drivers, so maybe you have to correct for their mistakes a little bit. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot to think about if you want to drive well and try to stay out of trouble. It really is like a lot of, of staying alert being aware of your surroundings and you're right compensating we've had a driver one time that was tailing so hard in traffic and we had to put the brakes on the trailer the person took offense passed us got ahead and then slammed on the brakes just to yep. try to make he a thought point, you were right? it's, it's called brake checking and he thought you you had brake checked him so he was going to brake check you and exactly they do it and what is it again we i know we're going over but what is the deal with these people that come around you get in front of you and then slow down yeah and, right. I understand. And, and now they make you have to react. If I, if I'm going to go around a tractor trailer and come over, cause I respect tractor trailer drivers cause we drive stuff. And, and so, you know, Similar. yeah, you get well past them signal count to three. So he can see what you're going to do. Don't signal in turn. Cause there's a delay and you've seen it. You see it in the road every day. So you signal 
you give him a chance to know you're coming, come over and speed up so you don't take mm -hmm. away his braking. You don't know what he's into. If you're going down a hill, he may be like on the edge and doesn't exactly. need you coming over. So you come over and get going. Yeah. And hope that people would do that for you, but they usually don't, unfortunately. No, you're so right. And Kim said, scary time hauling a semi blew out a driver's side steering tire. Mm -hmm. No shoulder, cliff wall on a PA turnpike. I stopped behind Linda in the four horse, maybe two feet from the ramp. We were thankful the semi truck around us were all safe. No one got hurt. I was standing on the brakes. Oh. I mean, you're right. You just never know when it's going to happen. Even a semi, you, you and that's, that's, you're so right. Like you respect semi drivers because you're like, they understand they have like very similar situation, but stuff goes wrong. Exactly. And, and don't ride next to them either. No. Like don't no. exactly what Kim's talking about. Like either no. wait until you can get on by or whatever, but don't be that one hanging. And they're, not only can they not see you much like sometimes you can't see them, but if they have a blowout or if they just have a brain fart and they're yeah. oh, I'm coming over, that happened right. to a friend of mine. She told a brand new car. Same deal. The guy just came over. He, I don't know what he was thinking. Um, I'm going to try this it, it, real quick. I don't know if this is going to make a mess or not. Let's see what happens here. Okay. Zeke oh, says hi. There he is. Hi, okay. A little bit lower so we can see his face. There we go. There There's he his is. face. There's his nose. <laughs> He's hanging out. He's like a champion anyway, now, isn't he? Um, One point away. That's and crazy. He'll have his point uh, it, 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 in... um. This spring, the Spinoni National Convention cool. is being hosted by his breeder. And she's like, oh, can wow. you wait and let him get his point there? And we're like, well, so we're not cool. going to sandbag every competition, but we'll try. And it actually yeah. happened to work out that, that he needs one point. And so if we just kind of put him in stuff between now and then that doesn't, it's like a different, yeah. you know what I mean? It won't hurt him on points. Cool. Yeah, he's doing good. That's so cool. Well, I'm so going to so again for just running run my mouth and going too long. But, no, you know, no. I uh, was trying to keep you so that we'd stay around an hour 40. So we're actually still right on track. So we're just fine. Okay. I still okay. think we need to have a third part where we really talk about driving, truck and truck. I agree. Safety. Driving, like, backing that's up. Good. That's a whole new level. Like yeah. I've learned so much from just experience, but there are just so many things that I think we could talk to and touch on in, in reference to driving the situations and stories and, and just things that we can be looking for, you know, even just yeah. hanging by the semi, like these are things that as people are starting to drive a trailer or a truck for the first time, we've got a lot of people kind of moving into that era of their lives. It's driving it's etiquette. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like when you see a gas station, you're like, where do I park? What's driving etiquette? Like what is oh, you being like a, that's a good point. asshole, like parking in front of people or behind people and like locking them in compared to like, where should you go? Where can you go if it's already full? You know what I mean? Linda like, also said oh, electrical would be huge. Oh. oh yeah. We could, Oh, I could talk about that all day too. So, um, <laughs> if you're but, available. <laughs> down, oh yeah. Down in um, like Dickerson or somewhere. I don't know. We yeah. used to go somewhere. There was a little Sitco station that had diesel mm -hmm. and there's no way, no way you're getting a truck in there. Yeah. And I would just go buy it. Like not an option. And then we went to another little store that was bigger and, and Alice and I both were hauling trailers and we got in and it was like a, a couple people parked and did this. And it's like, you just had to, retrace your steps you literally had to go back from where you came because there's no turning around and there's no, oh, no spinning and we had a friend with a six horse that took out the gas pumps one time because she just kind of overestimated her ability to get out of there and yeah. you know oh yeah we could talk we could talk about all that kind definitely of have anytime. to see about getting that schedule because right. i think it'd be huge and caravans what about when i have five people with trailers all going together how do right. you know yeah. Best and and those of you watching and listening at home and abroad, uh, think of some stories that when we come back and do that sometime, I want to hear, because we learn from each other. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, want to hear some of those stories of exactly. what went Absolutely. well and maybe what didn't, you know? Yeah. So think about that for our next live show. If we can get Greg, if not, it'll be soon in January. You guys, this will be the last show of the year. For 2023. Right. So thank you so much, Greg, for joining sure. us. Oh, happy to do it. Yeah. And and we'll schedule it again. It's up to you guys. I can make time yeah. anytime. Definitely. No, this has been wonderful. Thank you guys. Everybody who's been watching, please like, subscribe, go to our YouTube and subscribe. We're still trying to build up to a hundred followers on YouTube so we can launch all of our podcasting platforms. Thank you so much. We had Jen Naji just comment. Jen, I haven't seen you right here, so it's so good to see you. But this has been so helpful and enlightening. Taking lots of notes. Thank you, Greg. You guys well, have thank a you, wonderful Jen. I evening. Appreciate that. Yep. Absolutely. And we'll talk later.